Okay, good evening and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Lee Marsden. I'm the Head of Politics, Philosophy, Language and Communication Studies here at the University. Um, it gives us really great pleasure uh, both to welcome you but also to welcome our special guest this evening, uh, Norman Lamb, who's going to be in conversation with Charles Clark in just a few moments. Just to flag up for you um, uh, some things which are actually happening next week as well. Um, next Thursday, the same time, but in a different location. So it's Lecture Theatre 2. Uh, Speaker of the House, John Burkow, will also be in conversation with Charles Clark. Before that event, if you arrived early, mm -hmm. there's the opportunity to actually have Charles Clark sign um, his latest books, which are um, on Labour leadership and the Conservative leadership as well. Um, ideal Christmas presents. Um, I shall be getting them for my dad. He doesn't realise yet, but he, that's what he's getting. And uh, they really are very, very good indeed, and uh, I really commend those to you. But um, if you want to get a signed copy of that, um, next Thursday is the place to, and time to do that. Without further ado, last chance to introduce our guest. Lee, thank you very much. And can I just echo your thanks both to Norman for agreeing. Thank you very much, Norman, for coming this evening. Pleasure. And to all of you for coming out on what's a bit of a miserable night. Um, those of you who've been before will know that what we've tried to do in this series is get at what it is that's important about politics, valuable about politics, and by interviewing people who are prominent politicians across the political spectrum to understand what drove them into politics, what they think they've achieved in politics, what they think the challenges of the future are in politics. And so, Norman, um, that's what I'm going to do, is talk to you, first of all, for 20 minutes, half an hour, and then throw it open to all of you to ask any questions that you would like to uh, of Norman, either based on what he has or hasn't said, uh, or uh, completely different subjects. And I know Norman's more than happy to deal with um, questions right across the range. Uh, and just to emphasise, we are being recorded. Uh, this will be on YouTube. So uh, if you don't want to be recorded, uh, don't say anything. It's basically... <laughs> I said that to Norman Ernie. That's, not, said, an that's not an answer for me. <laughs> <laughs> now, Norman, you were brought up, um, as far as I uh, understand, firstly in Watford and then at school at Wyndham College here in Norfolk, in a very academic family, I think. Your father was a very distinguished climatologist. In fact, the building just across the road here is named after him in terms, in respect to the very distinguished work he did on climatology. And am I right, your grandfather was a very uh, a great mathematician uh, also? Three generations of professors, pro profes professors. professors and then a grubby politician, I'm afraid. So. Well, I was going to say a grubby lawyer, I think, that's where <laughs> we start first, and then, then go to the politician. But uh, tell me about, as you were being brought up, uh, was there politics in your family background? Was it uh, being an academic family, a, f a discussion of ideas? Was, was the conflict in there about how you approached the issues of the time when you were a young boy and a young man? Was politics part of your early life? Uh, well, my parents weren't political activists uh, when I was growing up, but they were acutely interested in politics and, uh, and always took it very seriously, and we discussed it uh, at home a lot and I, there was a photograph of me aged five with a liberal rosette on I'm afraid so that says something I that mean is, that perhaps is, that that's indoctrination start, yes, yeah indoctrination. Exactly. Okay. Um, so and I think my I mean my dad um, had been a Quaker um, uh, and had actually um, uh, conscientiously objected in the war uh, he, he'd worked for the Met Office at mm. that time and he was asked to get involved in forecasting uh, uh, work involving the potential use of chemical weapons, and he said he couldn't do that. And so he actually transferred to the Irish uh, Met, Met Service and did the forecasting for the first seaplanes going across the Atlantic. Um, so that was the sort of... And he'd rebelled against his parents, who were strong Tories. Um, so... Um, that was the sort of atmosphere that I grew up in. And it was conversation, it was being, seeing what was going on in the news, discussing the issues of the day. Obviously your father, from what you've just said, was a very committed person himself. Were you involved in political activism at all? Did, uh, did the, your experience with the Liberal Rosette lead you to uh, be campaigning in local elections or engaged in any of those kinds of local discussions? Yeah, I, and you never know how much um, your parents influence you. I suspect they did a lot, actually. But I, 
Um, I got involved in elections in the 74 elections. Uh, we lived in South Norfolk at the time. We'd moved up to Norfolk because Dad set up the Climatic Research Unit. That's what brought us here. Mm. Um, and we were living in South Norfolk and uh, the Liberals actually did very well in 74. We surged under the great leadership of Jeremy Thorpe, you may remember. One of the most successful liber liberal leaders, yeah. surprisingly. Yeah, um, got into a spot of bother after that. Uh, That's right, him and a dog. Yes, exactly. Uh, but no, I, I mean, I was out knocking on doors at the age of, I don't know, 14 or something. Oh, right. That's interesting. So if, uh, really, by comparison to most people, a pretty political start. Yeah, and I set up a young liberal branch at Wyndham College. Right. Uh, we used to meet in a pub in Wyndham. Um, and yeah, so it was, but I didn't get involved in student politics. Uh, I was going to ask, you then went to Leicester University and you studied law. Yeah. Was there a reason why you went for law rather than the academic subjects in your background? A desire to make a large amount of money or a desire to do good uh, or, or something? <laughs> why, why law? Why Leicester? And I was going to ask that very question you've half answered. Uh, were you involved in politics at all when you were at Leicester University? Well, I was at a complete loss as a teenager as to what I would do when I uh, was an adult. And my mother uh, was in despair over uh, me. Um, and, and I was sort of the underachiever compared to my two older sisters um, as a teenager. Um, Did you feel that? Yeah, mm. yeah, very much. Mm. Um, and I got to Leicester through the clearing system. Yes. I spent too much time doing art in my A-levels mm. um, and watching Norwich City. Uh, a trait, I think, that I've, afflicts I've, you as well. I've come to, I've come to yeah. suffer from it. Yes. Um, so, so I went off to Leicester to do uh, social sciences and then transferred to law. Uh, no, I just thought it would be an interesting degree. I didn't have any particular interest in getting a job that earned vast amounts of money at all. It wasn't particularly what motivated me. Um, we, I did get, I sort of got uh, obliquely involved in politics at university in that I ended up going out with a girl um, who actually you know. I don't know whether we've ever talked about this. We haven't. Um, <laughs> uh, you're, wor you're worrying me now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so our first date was a, um, was a protest outside the National Front headquarters. Uh, at, it was very romantic yeah. um, <laughs> in, in Leicester. And, and that was a time when the, the, the far right was very, very strong in Leicester. Yes. Um, and between 76 and 80. And uh, her name was Julie Hall. Oh, I know Julie, yes. Who, uh, who became Neil Kinnock's um, press secretary. She certainly did. Um, Jennifer Zier, if you remember. I remember she very, stood up. I remember very, yeah. very well. A very yeah. lovely woman. So, uh, but that, and I, I got engaged to her, for goodness sake. Right. Uh, you are surprising me now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I've, uh, Mary's here somewhere, so i uh, <laughs> But uh, that, that all fizzled out. Um, and I didn't really, I didn't, partic I didn't find student politics particularly uh, uh, enticing. But it uh, sounds as though you were pretty actively engaged. I mean, if you were protesting against the National Front and so on, you were still obviously yeah. engaged in political life, and it was a yeah. part of your personality and what you were. And then in the, in the final year at Leicester, um, the local MP, and this is, this is another embarrassment on my CV, uh, but the local MP uh, put an advert up in the law department for uh, a political uh, assistant, a parliamentary assistant, and it was a certain Greville Janner um, who's achieved a certain notoriety uh, of late. Uh, and I just saw this uh, advert and, and just immediately wanted to apply for it. And I became despite, an assistant... D despite the fact that he was a Labour MP, yeah. not, not a Liberal. You were, were you, did you still consider yourself a Liberal at that time? I, I remember he, we talked about it in the interview and, and uh, I regarded myself and always have done as centre-left. Mm. Um, and I, but I felt entirely comfortable working for a Labour MP. He wasn't particularly political, actually, no. in a bizarre sort of way. I, I suspect you remember that. I know him very well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and by the way, I uh, just in, in re respect to the reference you just made, I don't judge him. I, don't regard, I, I, I think it's very sad what's happened, but I don't regard it as clear that he's guilty of... Well, and I think there's quite an issue, actually, that um, people 
either in the situation he's in with dementia or after their death, yeah. get very easily condemned and assumed to be guilty. And I have, there's no, there was nothing from my year working for him that made me um, uh, believe that there was something wrong. Mm. I feel, I feel the same. I knew him very well. Uh, anyway, that's not the I didn't have much respect for him, I have to say, at the end of the year. Um, I didn't feel that he was motivated particularly by principle, uh, but I, uh, had, I enormously valued the opportunity. And I, I was working in Westminster in Dean's Yard, and, and this was the moment when the SDP was being formed. Uh, and I saw it all happening in front of me, and I remember writing to Shirley Williams to say, uh, could I, um, th three people working for Labour MPs wrote to her to say, could we meet with you? And she gave us an hour of her time, and, uh, and that um, was quite a, a motivating factor. I, I had picked that up in your Wikipedia entry that you'd worked for Greville, and then Shirley Williams had been influential in drawing you to join the SDP and yeah, that, so I was, was, one that, of those, a, was that, that a key moment for you? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was a member of the Liberal Party, mm. but you could, you could have dual membership mm. uh, in those, uh, at the start of the SDP. Mm. Um, and I was excited by what that uh, potentially offered. Um, and, and so, yes, uh, it was um, a big mot motivation for me. And, and of course, Shirley was a, a very uh, impressive woman. Mm. She's absolutely inspirational. Yeah. Woman person. And now, you know, she, I don't know, I think she's in her late 80s. I know. Uh, and her intellect and uh, brain is just extraordinary. She came here in this hall to do one of the two difficult box lectures on uh, nuclear disarmament because, as you know, she's worked on that recently. And the clarity of her address and mm. her, uh, the way in which she dealt with the various questions was quite extraordinary. She is, she is an extraordinary mm. person. So it, it, I, I, I didn't know the answer before this conversation. But it sounds to me as though you were pretty clearly a Liberal, then an SDP, then an SDP Liberal Alliance person through most of your life. There wasn't really a moment, I was slightly piqued to see the greville Janner connection, that you might have thought of going Labour at some point, people change in their youth. But really you were pretty clearly a Liberal in the broader sense of the word throughout yeah. your period of formation. Yeah. And, and my sort of belief in Liberalism, I suppose, has strengthened uh, rather than diminished through time. And then you joined Solicitor's Practice Steels here in Norwich, and you became a, a practicing solicitor here. Is that right? And then at some well, point, well, I actually trained at Norwich City Council. Oh, you um, did. And um, and I left Norwich City Council for one reason, because I couldn't stand for the council whilst working there. So I left and joined Steels. But, but the story is very clear that poli politics was driving you from a pretty young age, yeah. and everything else you did as a student or becoming a solicitor or whatever was part of helping you be able to carry through your political uh, ambitions? Yeah, I, I realised that my job in law uh, was a very interesting job and it was quite motivating, but ultimately it wasn't what I wanted to do. Yes. Now, you were then leader of the Norwich City Council here. Um, and it's Well, leader of the opposition. Leader of the opposition, sorry, yes. I, I forgot the <laughs> overwhelming power of Labour in those circumstances. Um, I often advise young people, I advise students here who ask me how do they get involved in politics and what do they do to think about uh, going into local government. I think it's a very good formation process. Just talk a bit about what that experience was like for you. What did it teach you? What do you think you brought to it? Uh, what are the qualities that you think you improved in yourself by that p period of your experience? What were the things that hopefully improved life in the city of Norwich as a result of you being there? Well, uh, first of all, I had to win my seat, which um, and it was in Nelson Ward, which is now solidly green, um, and and it we but we were in third place when we started working there, and and we had to slowly but surely over a three-year period turn it round, and we did, uh, and there was one awful moment when I was the city councillor, Mary was the county councillor, and our lodger won a by-election. So we had three councillors in one... It was kind of a broad, broad flush of the population that was involved yes. in the Liberal representation. <laughs> these. Uh, so I won, won the seat and, and then subsequently ended up leading the group. I mean, one of the things I did was I sort of proposed an environmental charter for the city. So I was sort of already very uh, interested in, in all of that, those issues. Uh, and 
Uh, of course, it got rubbished by the leading group, uh, but ultimately, uh, in part, it got adopted. Mm. Um, I, but I also learned an enormous amount about doing the, the, the sort of ward casework, mm. taking up people's issues, uh, winning successes for people. Um, and also, I mean, you, you, you indicated it earlier, Labour were extraordinarily dominant mm. uh, in Norwich, and um, Pat Hollis was around in those days and was a very powerful uh, politician in Norwich. Um, and and so you learn, actually, not only from what you do, but from the people that you're up against as well. Um, but I did four years there because I then decided that I wanted to have a go at were you Were you ambitious? Uh, you're also ambitious for your ideas. Had you already, by that time, become personally ambitious as well? You hoped to become a member of Parliament. Were you pretty clear when you went on to the Council that was something you hoped could come around for you and you'd work for that? Or was it a set of happenstance events? I ask because your success in North Norfolk uh, as a Liberal candidate is extraordinary. You did extremely well in terms of shifting um, support to yourself f from the Conservatives, much more so than comparable Conservative seats throughout the country. And it certainly wasn't obvious or predestined that you would defeat David Pryor in the 2001 election. Mm. Uh, and indeed, even at 2005, it would have been that there was a serious sporting chance that the Conservatives might take it back from It was from the fifth you. most winnable seat for the Tories. But, yeah. you, but you, in fact, extended your majority very substantially. How did you approach this? To what do you attribute your success, Mr. Lamb? I mean, what was it? Well, uh, what was going on? Well, first of all, you you asked a number of questions in that uh, uh, in that uh, contribution, uh, and you started by saying how you know how lo how long had you been pursuing the sort of parliamentary idea? Uh, after working for Greville for a year, uh, I was very clear in my mind that I wanted to uh, try to get elected to Parliament. So that was from twenty two. Um, but I was also very clear that I wanted to do it on my terms, on the basis of what I believed in. Because mm. there are quite a few people, including I think a couple of members of the current cabinet, but there were also people in the Labour cabinet who had been Liberals or Liberal Democrats and who had changed party. Now, you ca I, I don't begin to question uh, their individual judgments, but I suspect some people conclude that it's not a gr great career option. Yeah. Uh, being a Liberal Democrat, and there hadn't been a Liberal in Norfolk since about 1930. So it was tough territory here, uh, and there was no question of us being able to move. There weren't any winnable seats to move to, uh, so you had to create your own. Um, and I rather naively thought, um, if Paddy Ashdown uh, could do it in Yeovil, I, and I follow the same approach, then perhaps I can do it here. But, it, but it, standing in North Norfolk was a bit of an accident. Um, I had been planning to stand in Norwich South, and I... Keep out of my path. Yeah. <laughs> I, I saw you coming. Uh, not, but, not many did. But I... <laughs> but I... Uh, this was the period of the creation of the Alliance. Yes. Uh, and and the, the, the... Well, creation of the Liberal Democrats. Mm. And we went through a nightmare period. Uh, so we've experienced this before. Mm. Um, but we came forth behind the Greens in the European elections in 88 mm. or 89. And I withdrew my application in Norwich South because I just thought uh, there's no point sort of flogging a dead horse. And then someone said, there's no candidate in North Norfolk. Will you put your name forward? And so I, I did um, just to fly the flag. I had no intention at that point of fighting it seriously to win it. That's very interesting because in the, the figures suggest a different thing that you'd really, with great determination, as you say, like Paddy Ashdown down in Somerset in Yeovil. Well, once I got it, it well, one, once, I, once I was selected as the candidate, mm. then the competitive spirit got the better of me and I just decided to absolutely go for it. So what was it? Uh, I mean, critics like me of the Liberal Democrats would sometimes talk about pavement politics and just taking up a whole set of different issues, not the grand battle of principle of liberalism uh, or something of that kind or some ideological issue, but uh, just being the person who was always there th essentially through organisation to help individual constituents with their particular mm. problems. 
in that mix... And where, I don't think there's anything you, wrong in that. In nor, nor do I, by the way. I think it's an essential part of democratic politics mm. that it's done. And one of the criticisms of Labour in its many run-down areas is it didn't do that enough. It's one of the reasons why Labour lost in Scotland so badly mm. this time. Yeah. It hadn't done that kind of role. So I, I don't, yeah. I, I don't criticise it. Mm. But how did you see the balance between the battle of principle to get people to put a proper Liberal in Parliament and the battle of uh, keeping the streets clean? Well... You have, to, you have to do something sort of uh, special to um, win people over. Um, you know, we, with the electoral system we have, we were on about, I think, 26% or 27% when I was selected as the candidate in 91. Um, now, you have, to, you have to get from 26, 27% to 40 something percent probably to win um, how do you do that uh, and you have to win people's trust and uh, there are a lot of people who um, could potentially vote for you uh, but they don't because they assume you can't win mm. so you have to convince people that you can win and you have to win people over literally household by household uh, to believe that you're someone who's worth voting for mm. And, um, on a personal basis. Yeah. Mm. And in a sense, that's my one sort of sense of possible failure in that uh, we've persuaded people to vote for me on a personal basis. How much have we changed the politics? That's what I was getting at. Um, Why do you say that's a failure? You, th you think it's because you're Mr Norman Lamb, the MP, rather than you're Mr Liberal Democrat, the MP? Well, th th of course... To win a seat, you have to build up a coalition of support. Mm. So within the people who vote for me, mm. you've got absolute core Liberal Democrats. You've mm. got people who've been persuaded to the cause mm. uh, uh, because of the work we've done. You've then got uh, a whole load of people whose instinct would be to vote Labour, but who vote for me. Now, that was, of course... Um, to keep the Tories out. Yeah. Mm. Now, now, that... Uh, the, the, persuading those people to vote for me was of course massively challenged by the coalition uh, but still a lot of people who would instinctively say they were inclined to Labour still vote for me um, but then you've got a whole load of people who would instinctively say they were probably Tory yeah. who vote for you on a personal basis yeah. and so you build up this sort of personal coalition of support um, and you have to try and keep it together um, but you know, there was a there was a moment uh, recently which really sort of upset me in a way, and it was a very kind personal comment. But uh, I was just left reflecting of the uh, of the challenge ahead. In that, uh, I was at a meeting in Munsley, um, very crowded village hall. A man came out after me, chasing after me across the road, and he said, "I'm just so pleased you're re-elected. I voted for you. I think you're brilliant." Uh, when you stand down, I will return to the Tories. And I just thought, oh. <laughs> uh, it is interesting because the Liberals have got more of a success record of building up strong personal MPs in various parts of the country historically who then build a reputation and carry it forward. And, of course, that's what was challenged at this last election because you had a competition between personal commitment mm. and this overwhelming sort of panic that hit Middle England mm. about the fear in many people's minds of electing Ed Miliband. Yeah. Uh, that's true, I think. Uh, 2015, suddenly you're in government. You, that will have been a surprise to you since despite the relative success of uh, the Liberals, you still were well away from being a majority party. I never ever dreamt I would be in government. That's what I... Uh, and. I would say, as a critical political opponent, that sometimes oppositionism was part of the Liberal story. I agree. Uh, I totally and, agree. And that was because the Liberals hadn't, since 1930s, uh, ever been in government. And, of course, both Labour and the Conservatives have had to deal with all kinds yeah. of compromises, which yeah. are difficult and problematic. Uh, but then suddenly there you were. Sim this, that particular issue, symbolised by the tuition fees issue, but th there are a whole string mm. of issues, actually. When that moment happened and the coalition was formed, the Rose Garden was there, your friend Nick Clegg, who you'd work closely with, was there with the Prime Minister to say we're going to try and build something to last for five years. What did you hope for yourself in that time? I know you 
you became marked as a health minister and what you were trying to do in health, on mental health, on social care and so on. But was that your ambition then or were there other subjects you, you, you were interested in that you'd hoped to make your mark? What, what was your thought in 2015? Well, it, it had a rather sticky start in that um, on, I think the coalition was formed on the Tuesday mm. and on the third, of course, everybody's sitting there waiting to see whether you get a phone call. Um, and on Thursday early evening, uh, we were at home in Norwich. I got a call saying, this is the number 10 switchboard. Uh, can you speak to the Deputy Prime Minister? Uh, so the call came through and Nick said, um, we'd like to make you Minister in the Department for International Development. Um, would you accept it? And I said, uh, yeah, I will, definitely. And I was told you'll get a call from the Prime Minister later this evening to confirm. Um, I didn't get a call that evening. I got a call from the chief whip to say, everything's fine, you'll get a call tomorrow. Uh, and then the next morning, I got a call from Nick to say, uh, I'm so sorry, but the job we offered you last night, I can't deliver. So it wasn't a great start. Um, for about 12, did you, did you for about 12 hours, I was uh, notionally the minister in the Department for International Development. And I'd have loved that job, loved it. Um, and and I, it was actually my first position um, as a deputy to Jenny Toll mm. uh, in, the, my, in the first parliament uh, speaking on international development and I did a lot of work on uh, the arms trade and corruption and BAE systems, you, you may remember it from your time in government and the Al Yamami contract and all that and, I, and it was, I just, I, I loved it and, and I would have loved to be would a you minister. Have been, would you have been in the cabinet with that role? No, 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 it was a junior mm -hmm. role. And did you ever understand what actually happened in this miscommunication? I've never understood or heard the full story. Um, I think it was just an almighty cock-up. Uh, I, I but it caused some strained relations. I suspect you're right. I mean, I've seen a number of cock-ups at the reshuffle points. It doesn't... Uh, they, they, the Prime Minister or leader of the party has a big chart with all the various... with yeah. the, the names and the roles. And some the bits of paper get lost. And something yeah. goes wrong. And they're, they're, Wasn't there a story about Blair appointing someone who got the one, wrong one? Yes, and uh, well, that was suggested of Chloe Smith actually by David Cameron as well. Yeah. And it happened with, and there were some very good people in Labour who should have been in government and somehow weren't because of some mistake that happened. Yeah. It's an extraordinary uh, thing to say. Anyway, so you then went on. You went to health. Would you say that? If you'd had the chance, at international. I did. Development. I did eight months as a business minister. No, as well. I, saw, I know yeah. that, but that was that was a, a passing role, wasn't it? It wasn't something you. Well, I had to take a bill through Parliament. Mm. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was eight months, so it was very short, but it was a extraordinarily full eight months. I took the enterprise and regulatory reform bill through <coughs> Parliament. I was business min, uh, I was employment minister, but also responsible for Royal Mail mm. and the Post Office. And actually, I'd argued in. I'd taken a policy through our party to introduce employee ownership into Royal Mail and to uh, partially sell Royal Mail. Um, and that's what the government ended up doing. Um, so I, and I, I didn't take that legislation through. It was a period before that. But, um, but I also did trade policy. So I was on three different European councils. Mm. So it was an extraordinarily fulfilling, interesting period, um, but very short. And then I went into the Department of Health as a, as a promotion. I think you would be thought of as having made a significant mark at the Department of Health. Um, I maybe haven't got this right, but I think of that on the social care issues, which are very problematic, of course, and where uh, the, we, we had a lecture in the Two Difficult Box series by David Lipsy on that and the various issues that have to be sorted out, but also on your, what seemed to me from the outside as your efforts to push mental health up the uh, health agenda from the rather Cinderella role, which it sometimes plays into a more significant role. Have I got that right? Are there other subjects you would like to people to think of you as having made a difference in, in health, or are those the right ones? Well, I think there are, th there are three things. that. I, um, first of all, there was the CARE Act, which I took through mm. Parliament, and, um, and we introduced the uh, cap on care costs, mm. um, which is due to come in next year. Um, and this was Andrew Dilnot who recommended it. Um, and I think it would have made a considerable uh, difference, an improvement. Mm. And it starts to introduce a sort of concept of co-payment, I suppose. Um, uh, the Tories have now ditched that. They say it's postponed, but it's abandoned in my view. Uh, but I'm proud of the, the work we did on the CARE Act. But I'm acutely aware that at the same time as taking 
good legislation through Parliament and laying down good foundations, the financial settlement for social care, um, because it's within local government, which was being uh, having, having its grant cut very substantially, was extremely problematic. Mm -hmm. and, and the number of people getting help from councils was reducing. It had started to reduce under the Labour government, but it continued significantly in the last mm -hmm. five years. And I think ultimately, within health and care, you've got to shift more focus onto prevention. And I mm -hmm. don't think, I think that was a failure of the system um, to uh, protect the health budget, but not the social care budget. And so the second thing I very strongly advocated and I think got moving in the Department of Health was the whole concept of integrated care. Mm. Uh, and I said it from the day I went into the department, I told Jeremy Hunt that this had to be the focus of our efforts. I established integrated care pioneers around the country, which were the forerunners of what are now vanguards that uh, Simon Stevens has, has uh, head of led, the NHS. head of the NHS. Mm. Um, someone I have a high regard for, and I think he and I had a very similar mm. view of the health service. But then the, the, the third thing was mental health, and, 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 and I have a particular passion uh, for it. Uh, I think there's a historic injustice um, that you have very, very politically resonant uh, access standards, rights of access to treatment if you have a physical health problem. So if you have suspected cancer, you get a referral by your GP, you will see a specialist within a fortnight. If you're a teenager with a f who has a first episode of psychosis, something that can completely destroy your life, lead to a life on benefits, difficult relationships, all the rest, you have no such right. And there are no access standards in mental health at all, but this drives where the money goes. Uh, and, and you know, how can you justify that in a publicly funded service? So it was my sort of advocacy of that cause that, that I think I, I felt most strongly about. So as we get to the May 2015 election, just cast your mind back to when you were a boy, then at Leicester University, and when you first uh, had that meeting with Shirley Williams. You would say, and... Um, anybody here think you've taken a life in politics, you'd say you'd got involved in it, you'd kept to it, you'd made progress, and then you'd achieved a number of things that you would say were valuable, which, as it were, vindicated a decision to be a politician in life rather than a lawyer. Totally. I mean, I, 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 mean, I think politics, and I suspect you'll agree with this, should, could and should be a noble calling. I mean, ultimately, it's about trying to pursue your view of society and how you can achieve improvement mm. and change. And um, if there are things that you strongly believe in and you have a chance at doing something to implement those changes, then it can be very rewarding and, and worthwhile. Um, so, no, I'm uh, incredibly pleased that I've gone down that route. Being a minister was extraordinarily uh, invigorating, it, albeit incredibly challenging. You know, this was a... Through, through, through your decade in, in uh, government, um, um, the money was flowing. Um, I'd just love to have been a health minister during that period of uh, really exciting, dramatic change. And, and, you know, the Labour government did a lot of good things in the NHS in that period. Um, but it did reinforce this imbalance between physical health and mental health, which is what I've been trying to correct. Now, you then suddenly hit the wall of the May 2015 general election. And there you've got this extraordinary contradiction. The Liberals and under Nick Clegg's leadership took a decision, which they certainly thought to be, and for what it's worth, I agree, to be in the national interest to form a coalition government. Uh, the result was moving from over 60 seats to eight seats in eight individuals dotted 57 around. 57 seats. Sorry, 57. It, was in, it had in, been over it'd 60. Been over, it had been 62 and then yeah. came down to 57 yeah. in the uh, 2010 election. Um, so from the Liberal point of view, disaster. Total disaster. So as you reflect on the coalition years and what went on, you can take pride in what you feel you were able to achieve as a minister in that government in the way that you've described. But you also have to say, well, what happened to the Liberal Party in that period? Was my whole uh, purpose then destroyed? Mm. Just tell us what your reflections were of this, uh, of the experience of the coalition government from the Liberal point of view, not uh, or Liberal Democrat point of view, not from the point of view of your achievements, mm. which I understand mm. and you've described. 
Well, um, I suspect that people will see now that the Conservatives are in power on their own, um, what we uh, did to uh, constrain them in many ways. Uh, and I also think that we did some very good things. Um, the pupil premium is the thing that I'm in a way proudest of. Um, um, so you target resources at children from the poorest backgrounds um, from the start of their schooling. And the data uh, of children emerging from primary schools is starting to show a narrowing of the gap. Now that's quite exciting because you know, the, the long tail of underachievement in our country, the extent to which your chances in life are determined by the circumstances of your birth, um, is uh, deeply troubling, uh, I, I think. And I suspect it's an ambition that's shared by both Labour and mm. Liberal Democrats, that you want to see uh, equality of opportunity. And we don't have it in this country. Uh, so there are th as, there as an aside, I went to a lecture last night in London by Professor Robert Putnam, the leading political scientist, on exactly the re-emergence of class division in the United States, the breaking down of the American dream, making exactly the point that you've just made about how in this country things have steadily moved, not as bad as the United States, but moving in a positive way. Mm. Sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, but ultimately, it's been a brutal experience, and, and you know, I've, we were hugged for five years and then strangled. Mm. Um, and Doesn't, uh, isn't that naive of you? Uh, to allow yourself to be hugged and then strangled? Well, I, I always took the view that we were involved in a massive experiment. Could, could, can you have coalition government under first past the post is the, is the interesting mm. question. And I, I'm afraid I've concluded that you can't. Um, and I, don't, I think because of our experience, uh, which other small party is going to contemplate going into a coalition given what's happened to us? Mm. And it almost felt like there's a sort of law that says that the major party gets all of the credit for the things that go well, and the junior partner gets all the criticism. Do you think there were no mistakes by, I don't mean you personally, I think we made but lots the Lib Dem mistakes. leadership yeah, no. on precisely that question of how you located yourself in relation to some government decisions and so on? I think we made significant mistakes, definitely. I mean, bear in mind again, we, we hadn't been in government in the whole post-war period. So this is a new experience and the strain, the, the, the extraordinary strain of being in government at an incredibly challenging time mm. for a small party. Mm. And of course, Nick was having to make all of the big decisions. You know, every decision government makes, he was having to have to, to decide whether to go along with it or to block it. Um, and the resources at his disposal, certainly for the opening period, were inadequate, wholly inadequate. Um, so, uh, and I think Nick, in many respects, played a pretty uh, noble role actually through the last five years. He got um, uh, traduced by the media, uh, by much of the public, um, but ultimately he bore it with good grace. And I think, I think actually, in many respects, the country's in a better place in 2015 than it was in 2010. And we were, we were economically in a very dangerous place in 2010. And I think political stability was incredibly important. But, you know, I've always regarded the Tories as the opposition and Labour as the competition in a way. And, mm. uh, and so they weren't natural bedfellows. So then uh, Nick Clegg stood down um, and the leadership election beckoned and you decided to put your name forward. Why did you do that? What did you hope to achieve? Uh, you stupid fool. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't say that. In, in contrast, uh, the books that Lee was inviting everybody to sign next week uh, to help my Christmas as well as to help the Christmas of all the relatives here uh, we have, uh, is about political leadership. And uh, actually, I think political leadership is a very important thing, insufficiently understood. Yeah. Also, by the way, much tougher than people yeah. think. And the, the book on the... Liberals and all of, the, all of the liberal leaders reflect this. So I absolutely don't disrespect you for putting your hat in the ring to be a political leader. On the, the, the very reverse, I commend you for doing it. But I do ask the question, what were you hoping yeah, to achieve yeah. in it? Did you have a sense of what you would do had you been elected leader that you think was coherent? Mm. Obviously, you thought it was better than your opponent, Tim Farron, and you did much better in the election than many people thought. So you can pat yourself on the back that you did... I'm not being uh, mm. uh, trying to down with faint praise. Mm. Uh, you did a lot better than people thought because Tim Farron was the voice of protest and you were the voice of uh, trying to 
get into a position to govern again. Mm. But could you just describe a, a little bit what, what it was that made you decide to have a okay. go, including the personal thing? Why, did you th why, why on earth did you think you were up to it? I mean, to be a leader is a hard well, that thing was a, to that do. That was a massive question that I had to confront. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I guess a lot of people just assume that all of us are just madly ambitious for the top job. Mm. Uh, I wasn't uh, at mm. all. Um, and uh, I'd never thought of um, leadership. Uh, people started to raise it with me in, in the last parliament um, and started to sort of pose the question, uh, Nick will go if, we're, if we do badly and you need to think about it. So people were sort of putting that to me. But I came out of the election uh, and of course we'd been crushed and, and, uh, and, and I was completely exhausted. Um, and at that point, I had to make a critical decision, uh, personal decision for me and the family. Mm. Um, and I went through torture that weekend after the election uh, in a state of exhaustion and uh, depression because of how badly we'd done, trying to make a decision about whether to go for it. And I talked to various friends, obviously to Mary, and ultimately concluded I would go for it. Uh, and one of the things that I have always I, uh, uh, suffered from is I, I don't, I'm not a naturally confident person. And when I arrived in Westminster, um, I remember a conversation with you, which I found quite daunting, on our first, the first Monday there. Uh, you were quite aggressive. Uh, I, I know it's out of character. I think I, you, you must be misremembering. I think <laughs> not me. I think some other fat chap with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> but but I but also but I came. You know, there I was, uh, in in government, surrounded by people with extraordinary self confidence. Uh, usually, Oxbridge and public school, um, and you know, I sort of spent a lot of time thinking, what the hell am I doing here? Mm. Um, so. Uh, I had to overcome that in order to decide to stand rather than uh, it, it just being a natural thing for me to decide to do. Um, but I decided ultimately after talking to quite a lot of people that um, uh, I should do it uh, and that I wanted to do it. Uh, and what would you describe was the difference of approach between yourself and your opponent Tim Farron? What, if you could sum up what you, you thought you would do as leader compared to what he thought he would do as leader. How would you describe that? Well, I think our styles are, are very, very different. Um, and um, and I, I have no idea whether I'd have had any chance of being successful at it. Um, uh, but I, I felt that I could have... Um, I felt that through the work that I'd done, both... Uh, first of all, as a constituency MP and breaking through um, a 15,500 Tory majority uh, and winning people over. But then I think in the work that I'd done as a health minister, um, I felt that I had a chance of winning people over to the, to the cause. But I wanted to do it very much um, building a clear brand for the Lib Dems, a, a, a progressive liberal force. And I think that you know, if we think about where we're at now in politics, both progressive parties in our country are in a state of uh, crisis, I think. Um, and yet in a democracy, it's critically important that there is a strong alternative force. Um, and the prospects of the Tories being in power for a generation, I find deeply unattractive. Um, and, but there's a very real risk that that happens. So there is an overwhelming need to build a credible, in my view, liberal progressive force that can take on the Tories. Um, now, doing that from a position of eight MPs is, uh, to say the least, problematic. Uh, but I'm, I think this could be a very interesting five-year period. Uh, and, well, and that's what, in a sense, gives me just a little bit of hope. Well, I'll now ask my final questions before asking uh, colleagues in the hall to ask what they have to say. But um, I, of course, agree with you that we are in a state of crisis. Labour had a leadership election which gave us a sense of crisis, about which I gave a lecture here a while ago. We're still in that position. Um, the question of cooperation on the left uh, on, on maps is difficult. You've just said, and I understand it, that you can't 
see a very good case for Liberals governing in coalition with somebody else again because of the experience you had from 2010 to 2015. Um, how do you then see yourself? Because you won't get from eight Liberal Democrat MPs now to uh, 250 or 280 Lib Democrat MPs at the next general election, uh, almost whatever else happens. So it would need to be, if it wasn't to be a Conservative government after 2020, some kind of uh, association, I use the loose word, uh, that could govern in those circumstances, mm. which is very difficult because, as you know, many of my Labour colleagues are more critical than I am of the Liberal Democrats and think of the idea of working with the Liberals as a very difficult thing to do. Um, there, and uh, it's not clear at all how we move forward. I agree about the interesting point, but interesting in what ways? <laughs> well, um, so nothing may change. We may get to 2020 with Jeremy Corbyn leading the Labour Party um, and with us sort of um, trying to uh, re recover some ground. <coughs> or uh, there is just a chance, and I, I don't, uh, I'm not claiming that there is this great prospect, but there is just a chance that politics could fracture uh, in this five-year period. Um, and the interesting event that um, no one at this stage knows what the impact of it will be is the European Refer referendum. Uh, the last European ref referendum actually uh, ultimately led to a fracturing of politics. Um, I would dearly love for something new to emerge. Uh, 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 I mean, obviously, I, I would. By something new, you mean a party well, rather than an association of parties? Well, I, I don't know what form it would take, and, 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 and I don't want to sort of, in a way, speculate on that, because I don't think it's particularly instructive or helpful at this stage. What I absolutely think we should be doing is talking across boundaries. Um, so. I'm just about to embark on a project with a Labour MP, actually, um, uh, writing a chapter of a book about um, uh, sort of the future of public services, how you uh, sustain good quality public services. Um, I'm very, very interested in the whole sort of mutual concept, the um, uh, John Lewis concept, if you want to call it that. But um, could you apply that to... Uh, and it doesn't have to be involve personal profit, but could you apply that sort of concept of um, uh, employee ownership within public services? Yep. Um, and, and there's a, a, a Labour MP, that, uh, a guy called Stephen Reid, who was a leader of um, Lambeth Council, yep. who developed Very the idea guy. of a John Lewis Council, actually. Yes. Very interesting guy. And we're going to write something together. Uh, but I think the need, I think think tanks in London need to provide a sort of forum for politicians across the boundaries. Caroline Lucas, I've had very interesting discussions with her. We agree on quite a few different things. Uh, let's just talk at the moment and let's see what might emerge from that. For what it's worth, I agree with that in the policy area. I think there's lots that can be talked about. A particular turn was taken by the 45 to 50 Labour government with what's called Morrisonian nationalisation, a particular form of nationalisation and public ownership based on a centralised state. A whole series of cooperative approaches, mutual models, municipal activities mm, mm. were alternatives mm. within that broad frame, mm, mm. which ultimately didn't get followed. Question, can that be re-established? Yeah, yeah. Does that extend to organisational things? I said in a lecture here a month or so ago um, that I could imagine circumstances where Labour and the Liberal Democrats might agree on, say, half a dozen uh, targets for Labour and the Liberal Democrats to stand down to allow the other one to come through. Do you think that kind of thing is completely ridiculous? Do you think it's imaginable? It happened in the early days of Labour and the uh, Liberal Democrats with, uh, um, uh, with the major politicians deciding what to do. Do you think that's a mad idea? Do you think it's something which could happen? Uh, well, I, I just have a completely open mind, mm. uh, really. Uh, but I, the, but the big, the, the big problem we have, and it goes back to what happened, I went through the last parliament thinking, thank God that we've got Ed Miliband as Labour leader, because at least it, uh, uh, we're not, we haven't got a successful, uh, or a, a Labour party that's likely to make a big breakthrough. I felt, because I just, I reached a personal view that I didn't think Ed, uh, was, had the qualities to be a, a, a really effective it's leader. It's all right now, we've got Jeremy Corbyn, so it's okay. Well, 
I don't want to sort of impinge on sort of grief within the Labour Party, but, um, but the point I was going to make was I thought that gave us an opportunity. In fact, I was completely wrong. Uh, having a, 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 a Labour leader that is either unelectable or hard to elect is actually disastrous for us. Um, because the message in every Lib Dem Tory seat was, for Christ's sake, don't vote Lib Dem because you're going to get Labour. Mm -hmm. You've got to vote Tories to keep out this mad Ed Miliband. Mm -hmm. And now it, we've, we've got a by-election today in um, the Broads area of North Norfolk. I've, I've spent the whole day getting drenched in uh, Ludham. Um, uh, and it's very glamorous, in, this life. In the Broads or above the surface? <laughs> Part and part. <laughs> but, but the Tory message through this campaign uh, has been don't risk a Jeremy Corbyn-led Labour Party running Norfolk because if we lose the seat to the Tories, the Tories will take over control of Norfolk. Mm. So they use this very powerful message against us. So it's in our interest, in my view, to have an electable Labour leader. Mm. And I don't see any circumstances in which we would, it would be sensible for us to have any uh, cooperation with a Jeremy Corbyn-led Labour Party because it will just bring us down in all those seats where we're Would trying. Tim Farron agree with you? Because some people see Tim Farron as Jeremy Corbyn as relatively similar in the sense that they speak for protest rather than mm. for potential government. Yeah, I don't know what his view would be on that. Okay, we've had a long, and I hope you'll agree, absolutely fascinating conversation so far. Thank you, Norman, for the way you've spoken and been very open. It's now over, open to you. I'm going to take the questions in threes. I'll try and get varieties I can. We have roving mics, I'm glad to say, going around the hall, so please indicate. Firstly, a gentleman just over there, just down in front of you. Then a gentleman right in the middle. And I can't see a woman, so I'll take the gentleman here. So firstly, the gentleman there. Can you give your name and um, interest, as it were, please? Yes, jo John Harvey. I don't know whether you remember, Norman, but some 25 or 30 years ago, in conversation with you, I said that I thought, and this was before... I knew anyway that you had any prospect, any thought of becoming an MP. I said to you, I thought the big problem that the Liberal Democrats had was they had no chance of power, and having no chance of power, they could not attract good candidates to stand for Parliament. Cheers. Now, you <laughs> you <coughs> proved me spectacularly wrong over a period of five years, but looking ahead now to the future, do you think that that is the situation again now, that the Liberal Democrats do not appear to have much prospect of power, and in that situation, it must be very difficult to attract people of quality to stand for Parliament for the Liberal Democrats? Thank you. Gentleman in the middle there, yep. Uh, David Wright, uh, my interest the health service. Is Jeremy Hunt incompetent in the way he's dealing with the junior doctors, or is it... Uh, Dastardly strategy. <laughs> uh, gentleman down here with the red jumper. Just down here, yeah. My, my question's similar. Uh, is, will Could Jeremy, you identify yourself? Sorry, please? Alan Lachlan, uh, interest in health. Is Jeremy Hunt, will he be in power in another week's time? <laughs> and would we be in the situation with the junior doctors, 98% of them, wanting to go out on strike if we still had a coalition. Go on. Uh, well, the point you raise, John, first of all, um, is actually a, a very good one. I, I think it's incredibly difficult to get um, people who are prepared to put the monumental effort that's involved in, but who are also sort of successful people in, in another field. Um, and what I had to, I mean, I, I had sort of had to give up 11 years of, of my life, and to some extent uh, it has an impact on family as well, um, to win the seat. And it's not just fighting three elections, it's, it's all the year round. So it's on a night like this, going to a village hall somewhere in North Norfolk, to a meeting with 30 people, um, and contributing to it, and having something sensible to say, after a long day's work uh, as in the lawyer's office. Um, and then, you know, quite often sitting in my office on the business park off Hall Road at gone midnight, um, getting the law stuff done uh, because I hadn't got it done during the day. So, you know, it, it required an enormous sacrifice. 
And how many people are willing to do that? Uh, and, and willing to do it who have something potentially big to contribute on the national stage. And that's just incredibly difficult. But I think also, I mean, we, I was reflecting on this with a uh, colleague uh, in Parliament this week. We, we had a debate on um, votes for 16, 17 year olds, I, something I believe in. Uh, and I was speaking on that in terms of local government in that particular debate. But I was just, you know, the, the quality of the contributions from around the place was not great. Um, and, you know, it's interesting with the Labour leadership, um, a lot of people were uninspired by the choice, ultimately, that uh, was available within the Labour Party. And some of the big figures from the past, you know, did this current generation match up uh, to uh, the, the, the colossus of Charles Clark, for example? I'm beginning um, to regret asking you to come and see Get uh, so the, I think get it's an absolute... Get on with the other question. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, well, clearly, to end up with a vote, uh, where are you? Yes. Incidentally, David is chair of the James Paget Hospital, which has just been rated good by the Care Quality Commission. So, he's, yeah. um, so clearly, when you have a, a ballot with a 98% voting in favour of strike action, something's gone badly wrong. Um, and the BMA is often a pretty challenging organisation. Uh, they are very, very resistant to change. But I think, I mean, I think this has been mishandled. Um, and I, I remember back to the conversation I had with John uh, at, up at the Norfolk and Norwich uh, Hospital. Um, and the view that John expressed uh, was that um, the Norfolk and Norwich doesn't have much of a problem with the junior doctor's contract, the current junior doctor's contract. Uh, they get the hours of work necessary from junior doctors. Uh, there's sometimes an issue with uh, senior consultants, um, and I have heard, um, I'm not sure whether there are any senior consultants in here, uh, but I have heard um, some chief executives within the NHS talk to me about how some consultants in some specialties uh, extract an arm and a leg for working weekends. Um, and I think that's wrong. And it's always covered up. But um, they're already pretty well paid, comparatively. And to uh, charge enormous uh, rates to do additional work, I think, is, is rather immoral, actually. But not a problem with the junior doctor. So I don't understand the fight that he's picked here. Um, uh, uh, wider reflection, Jeremy Hunt was actually, uh, I, got, I worked well with him. He never stopped me doing anything. Um, I don't think he particularly understood mental health, but he, at some critical moments, he helped me achieve the things that I was trying to do. There was a moment when he told me that uh, the introduction of the first ever maximum waiting time standards in mental health, which I think is of fundamental importance to achieve equality. We introduced them in April this year. But he said to me at one point, I think it's going to have to just be a manifesto commitment for uh, 2015 election. And I said to him, if that's the case, I'm resigning. Um, and I didn't hear any more after that. It, and he helped me to get it through. But I had to, at one point, stand up to him on that. But uh, um, now, Alan, uh, just remind me again of your question about Jeremy Hunt. Will you be empowered this time? And... So, uh, so my overall view about the, uh, uh, the sort of, the, the NHS and the care system, it's not just the NHS, um, faces an existential challenge. And I believe that it's, we are heading towards a crash uh, which could have pretty ugly consequences. The Health Foundation yesterday, a very respected organisation, um, predicted a £6 billion funding gap in social care by 2020. Now, there are real consequences for that, consequences in terms of care of elderly people, disabled people, and indeed a bigger impact on the NHS, because if you don't care for people properly at home, uh, they end up unnecessarily in hospital. So my criticism is more of the Treasury, actually, of George Osborne, um, 
And I think that we have to, I've argued for a non-partisan commission to bring all of the politicians together. Charles has written and spoken about some quite controversial ideas about the NHS. Uh, but we need to have, we need to give politicians the space to um, think about the solutions to the challenges we face. And it involves both more money, but it also involves reform of the way the system works. Thank you. So it's the Treasury, not Jeremy Hunt, ultimately, that is responsible for this. Thank you. Other questions? Um, I know it's quite prejudiced me. I'm looking for women, but I can't find any. Uh, so we're all a story of my life. Uh, no. uh, the uh, woman just there, first of all. Gentlemen down here. I'll take all five, actually. So uh, after this woman, come down if you can here, and then we'll front, then go right to the back. So yes. My name is Chris Harvey, and I was once involved with the campaign for fair votes. Do you, am I right in concluding that you would welcome electoral reform? And if so, uh, how do you think this is feasible? Uh, and in what form, what form would you welcome? Thank you. Thank you. Gentleman down the front here with the red jumper. So Matthew Bone, I'm a PhD student here in environmental science. And first of all, I'd like to thank you both for hosting such a debate. Uh, it's a very interesting comment you made, Norman, for or about um, politics fracturing within the next five years, which is ironic considering the Houses of Parliament are actually falling apart and need either renovation or complete upheaval to someone new in the near future. Now, the latter could actually be hugely beneficial for British society as well as politics, but this would be a very radical move, and given the stagnation of British politics, is there any will to make a change? And would the relocation of the British capital to a location more central within the UK provide a better platform of representation given Scotland's growing political power? I think the answer he's going to give is Mundley. Uh, there, were, <laughs> there, 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 there were three people who had their arms up at the back. The, the two gentlemen right there, yes, please. Hello there. Uh, my name is Ian Robertson. At the start of the coalition, there was the coalition agreement, which I thought was a masterpiece of very rapid drafting. It looked and sounded like a contract. Given your legal background, did you have anything to do with this document? And can you tell us something about how it came to be, please? Okay, very interesting. Now, there's somebody just behind you. That's right, the gentleman just behind you. Uh, my name's Jonathan Smith. Um, Jonathan. Yes. Yeah. Um, my question concerns mental health. Uh, it's to partly your view of it. I know you have represented uh, on various occasions uh, mental health patients with particular issues. Um, what is your relationship and your view of, <laughs> I mean, I, I know quite a few mental health patients and they have certain issues and I am aware of mental health as a service. I wondered what your views were be of the relationship between the two, because they're often c quite contradictory. Um, I won't go any further. Okay. No. There was one other hand up earlier in that part of the hall, but uh, there. there's a gentleman just there, yes. Just straight over you. Just, oh, you've, you've already got the mic. Okay, thanks. Go. Uh, Toby Bennett. And I'd just like to ask, uh, do you think a Republican president would harm our relations with America? Thank you. Uh, how about relations with America? With America, yeah. Norman, there you are. Five interesting questions. Blimey. Yeah. Um, so well, you've got a grandfather who's a great mathematician. You must <laughs> be able to count. <laughs> uh, so, Chris, first of all, uh, yes, I still very strongly uh, agree with the need for reform of our voting system. Um, do you agree with that? Charles. I do. I'm in favour of the alternative vote. I campaigned for the right. referendum. I won't get into politics, but I think the AV referendum was very badly handled. It was. Indeed. Disaster. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, so, and, and part of the problem was that most of the people campaigning for it uh, didn't whole, d thought it was the second best option. Charles thinks it's the best option. I do. Uh, but a lot of people felt that as they campaigned, they were campaigning for something that was second best, which isn't necessarily the most inspiring thing to be doing. Um, so, uh, I mean, I believe in STV or the Jenkins uh, proposal, which I think... And indeed, the, the systems that operate in uh, Scotland and uh, Wales seem, seem to work 
quite well. Um, they're hybrids in a way. Um, and people do, there is this thing about liking the link between the constituency MP and, uh, and their, uh, the community they represent. Uh, I think that can work with STV, but uh, I would go for either of those. I don't, I'm not a zealot on a particular system. Um, but I think ultimately, if you're a Democrat, how can you justify a system that uh, delivers a majority government with a, a, a very significant minority of the votes? Uh, and I think it gives a sort of false sense of um, authority to a government uh, because they've got those seats in Parliament. And there's another sort of manifestation of this. Um, in Westminster, we have been written out of the script now completely because we have eight seats. The uh, Scottish Nationalists have 56 seats. And under parliamentary sort of process, um, procedure, the Scot Scottish Nationalists get called third after the government and the uh, opposition. We just have to take our chance in the debate in the hope that we might get called. Uh, but the Scottish Nationalists will, be get, will get called in a debate on the English National Health Service before us. Now, we, we got, across the United Kingdom, we got far more votes, vastly more votes than the Scottish Nationalists. But the way the system has worked, it's delivered uh, 56 as against 8. And 25% of the British public voted either UKIP, Lib Dem or Green. Now, they have great divergent directions, but that group of people, 25%, got 10 seats. 25% of those who voted have 10 seats representing them. And this is supposed to be a democracy. So, uh, yes, I think there's an uh, overwhelming need for change. I don't see any way that we're going to get it for the foreseeable future. Um, the critical thing will be Labour at deciding uh, to absolutely go for it. Um, and uh, I don't know what will emerge there. That's the place to watch and until Labour commits itself to a reform of the voting system, I don't think we have any chance at all. Um, so, um, Matthew, um, well, first of all, I, I, don't, I think it's quite hard to justify spending the amount of money that was planned for, to enable Parliament to return to that building. Um, and I think there are, there are some good arguments for us going to a different building, uh, a, uh, I don't like the confrontational nat nature of the chamber in the House of Parliament. Um, most modern parliaments uh, are designed differently. Uh, I think that's much better. Um, so I would use this opportunity to move into a modern parliament. Um, I'm not convinced that we should... Uh, are you suggesting that Birmingham, for example, should become the capital city of our country? Not necessarily Birmingham, but somewhere which is more proportionally representative of the UK in general. Mm. So somewhere more centrally located. Yeah, well, it's an interesting idea. I haven't really thought about it, I'm afraid. But, uh, I'll, but I will continue to think about it. Germany, but, yeah. Financial capital and political capital. No, I, I see that. And so we should be open-minded about these things. I think the, the one interesting thing I would just reflect on is the fact that I, I've just been asked and I've agreed to chair a commission on mental health for the West Midlands for the combined authorities in the West Midlands. This is covering four million people, um, Birmingham, Coventry, Wolverhampton, the, the black country and so on. Um, and these are the combined authorities that have entered a devolution deal with the government. Now I don't particularly, I don't particularly go along with the way that the government is devolving power and I would prefer a devolution not only of responsibility for running services, but for raising money as well. We're the most centrally, we're the most centralist country in the whole of Europe, apart from Malta, in terms, and they've got a good reason, um, in, the, in terms of where the money is raised. And I think you end up with a dependency culture. So I would love to see a return to the sort of competitive localism between those great cities that in Victorian times uh, competed with each other and became very grand places. Uh, I'd love to see that return. And I visit Birmingham now, and there is sort of just signs of life there. You know, you go into uh, New Street Station, there's this wonderful new development there. And uh, could Birmingham again become a really powerful city in its own right with control over its destiny? That's what's lacking at the moment in our country. Um, Your role in the coalition agreement? 
Uh, no, there was no role, I'm afraid, I, uh, uh, for good or ill. Um, I mean, I contributed in my a- areas of policy to it, uh, and it was drawn up very quickly. Um, and I think it was actually, you know, s- subject to the fact that the coalition virtually killed us, um, I think it was a good construct for good government, actually. Um, and my, my great frustration is that... Uh, uh, I'm not a Tory and I never will be a Tory, but I think in many respects the coalition sort of worked quite well. Um, and uh, I think that there were moments, I mean, I just take as one example the cap on care costs. Now, that, that wasn't in the coalition agreement. It was in a, an agreement reached uh, halfway through the parliament for the second stage. Now, in a one-party government, the Treasury will always prevail on an issue like that. And the Treasury was strongly opposed to introducing a cap on care costs. But we had a negotiation with the Tories and Nick uh, won a cap on care costs in a negotiation with Cameron and Osborne. And we legislated for it. Now, because they're now in government on their own, they've abandoned it. But uh, that would never have happened in a single party government, in my view. You could never get that sort of reform. So I think sometimes things happen, reforms happen uh, in a coalition that wouldn't happen in a single party government. So I think it's a, and, and I think it, it, there, was a, there was an accountability about that coalition agreement uh, between the two parties, which by and large was respected. The, the big area of fallout was their failure to deliver on Lord's reform and the failure to advocate for it. I mean, they just, Cameron just gave up on it and just allowed a rebellion to grow. Um, and so in return, uh, the Lib Dems withdrew our support for uh, boundary changes, which would have massively advantaged the Tories beyond the situation we're in now. Mental health. Uh, so, <coughs> well, my, uh, I, I do, I, I think I understand the, the point that you're, making and for me um, the NHS as a whole not just in mental health but is still too often paternalistic it doesn't actually empower people Um, and one of the things that I changed in government was that people suffering mental ill health were excluded from the legal right of choice Labour introduced uh, and rightly so a legal right to choose where you get care but they excluded mental health um, and it's hard to justify that. Uh, and so we've ended that exclusion. But for me, the, um, the whole focus should be on the experience of the individual. And the, the focus of our attention should be on building resilience, particularly am- amongst young people. There's a growing prevalence, we think, of mental ill health amongst young people, teenagers in particular. Uh, there's, a, there's a new... Uh, prevalence survey being undertaken at the moment which we initiated in the last year of the government um, to understand how the prevalence is growing but building resilience for young people getting uh, work in schools much better on stopping the deterioration of health a much more personal focus is the way that I uh, would like to see things move Um, and sometimes services are rather neglectful of the rights of individuals. And uh, I think that has to fundamentally change. Finally, the Republicans. Uh, Well, I think, I mean, if if you listen to the debate, uh, now, who was it again? uh, Yeah, there. I mean, if you listen to, to, if you catch some of these debates between the Republican candidates, it is incredible. You know, they are just way off uh, the scale. Uh, uh, on the issues that they're debating and the attitudes that they are uh, offering. Um, and they represent a, uh, a style of politics that, uh, it, I mean, is way to the right of UKIP on many things. Um, uh, so I very, very much hope that they do not prevail. Uh, the, I don't see a single candidate amongst the Republicans that... Uh, um, is moderate and uh, rational and internationalist. Um, And that's a pretty depressing uh, conclusion. I'm afraid, I'm sorry, we can't take another round. We've run on longer than we should have done, and I apologise for that. But I'm sure we'd all want really to say to Norman, thank you very much. You've given a tremendous uh, discussion, explanation, insight into your own 
political driving forces, as well as dealing with the range of questions that you've done at the end. So, Norman, thank you very, very much indeed Pleasure. for coming this Enjoyed evening. It.